Good morning. It has been an honor and a privilege to be with you this weekend. Thank you all for treating me so well. This is my first time in Arizona, and I had a great experience. Can I get an amen? amen. Yes. Thanks so much to Pastor Zach for bringing me out for Faith, Hope, Love. I just want to recap really quick what we talked about with Faith and Hope, because on a Friday morning, I got to speak for chapel here at Thunderbird, and we talked about, yeah, and we talked about how faith is trusting that God can take evil and turn it into good. And then last night, at Vespers, we talked about hope. We talked about how hope is recognizing that even if the end result isn't what you expect, that there's still value in the work. So that's what we covered the last two days, and of course, that means this morning, we get to cover the topic of love. Now love, my friends, is a funny thing. When I was in undergrad at Pacific Union College, my best friend was a girl named Ariana. And we had these nicknames for each other, Ariana and I. I would call her Diva, and she would call me Jerk. That's actually what we called each other. We'd say, hey, Diva, how are you doing? Hey, Jerk, how are you doing? And I want to tell you a little bit about the background of why we had these nicknames for each other and how they evolved over time. You see, when I first met Ariana, before we became close, before we became best friends, there's this thing in Southern California where I grew up called Junior Senior Bible Conference. And so what happened is all of the high schools in Southern California would go to this weekend retreat, this spiritual retreat for the weekend, and there was always a high school praise band. And this was very prestigious to be a part of this praise band. You had to try out to be there in the praise band. There were all the best musicians from Southern California who were vying for these different positions. And during my senior year, junior, senior Bible conference, Ariana was one of the four lead singers. And so, a couple years later, when Ariana started to attend Pacific Union College, she was known as the Bible Conference Girl. She was like a mini Adventist teenage celebrity walking around campus. And when we were younger and less mature, she knew that she was a teenage Adventist celebrity singer as well. So I gave her the nickname of Diva. The reason that Ariana called me Jerk was because I can be a jerk. <laughs> Especially in the area of music. I have a very type A personality. I tend to be very organized and like things done a specific way, especially when it comes to me leading out in music. And so Ariana, Ariana and I would be in these praise bands together, and she would really get on my case when I was like yelling at our friends because they weren't playing exactly what I wanted them to play, or they'd show up a little bit late, or they weren't playing the right chords. And so we developed kind of this healthy teasing for each other, diva and jerk. Love is a really funny thing, though. Love has this transformational power to it, doesn't it? Just like when we encounter God's love, we have this understanding that we cannot encounter God's love and go away unchanged, right? God's love has this transformational power. It changes who we are. And in the same way, when we start to know people on a deeper level, when we start to love them truly, we cannot continue on being unchanged. And there's this deeper level of understanding as you begin to know a person. And this is exactly what happened with Ariana and I. We became closer and closer friends. We started to realize like how we were raised, why I was the way I am, my background and what led me to have this type A personality and this love for music. I started to learn about her who she was, how she was raised, 
how she fell in love with singing and how she fell in love with music, and this did not leave us unchanged. When you start to know somebody on a deeper level, it transforms your opinions about them, it transforms how you think of them, it transforms your relationship. And these two friends, me and Ariana, started to fall in love. Eventually we started dating. We dated for five years. Then we got engaged for over a year. And this last summer, we got married. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Marriage, yes. <laughs> um, it's fascinating to look back on these circumstances and these two people that called each other diva and jerk and how transformational of a power love can be. Love is a really funny thing. Let's bow our heads as we dive deeper into this idea. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your presence here in this place. We just ask that you would help us to redefine faith, hope, and especially this morning, love, so that we can consider the things that you would have us learn about who you are and how you can work in our lives. This we pray and everybody said. Amen. So, the first time that we hear the phrase, God is love in scripture, is found where, people? Pastor Zach said 1 John, do we agree? 1 John, someone else says 1 John. Yes, we often associate this phrase, God is love, with 1 John because he says it really explicitly. But I would like to teach you something this morning, and that is this. The idea that God is love is actually one of the first messages that Scripture ever speaks about because in ancient Near Eastern culture, People of all different nations, tribes, and tongues were telling these things called creation myths, creation stories. And I want to show you one creation myth that was very popular during the ancient Near Eastern time when the Israelites and God's people were recording the events of Scripture. This is what we call the Enuma Elish. Turn to your neighbor and say, Enuma Elish. The Enuma Elish is the Babylonian creation myth. And without getting into too much detail, what we have here is one god and one goddess. Over here, on the right-hand side, we have a god named Marduk. Turn to your neighbor and say Marduk. And on the left-hand side, we have a goddess named Tiamat. Turn to your neighbor and say Tiamat. And the way that this Babylonian creation myth went is that the god Marduk cut Tiamat in half. And from the guts and the blood and the entrails, and all of the nasty things that happen when you cut a person in half, that is how the world was created. In fact, a lot of creation myths during that time spoke to an, a world and a humanity that was created out of violence and bloodshed. And humanity was often seen as slaves or, or servants to please the gods. But all of a sudden, something happened. All of a sudden, there was a different creation story that started being told. And, and this creation story started speaking of a God that looks over all creation and says it is very good. This God creates humanity with a purpose. And not only does he create humanity with a purpose, but he actually partners with that humanity. They're not slaves, they're not servants, they're partners with God. This is a God that creates with intention and love and joy. My friends, God is love is one of the first messages that we ever hear about, and it starts in Genesis chapter 1. And all throughout Scripture, these people of faith, these biblical authors, are trying to understand who is this God of love. And how does this God of love actually work in our lives? How do we interact with this God of love? And so it's here, thousands and thousands of years later, that we encounter a man named Paul. And Paul writes this book called 1 Corinthians. And in chapter 13, Paul begins to define what love is. And I'd like to read you just a little bit of this. Most of you have probably heard it before. It says this, love is is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not seek 
to dishonor others, it is not self sorry, it's not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Paul is beginning to define love, and a lot of times we'll hear this text at like a special celebration of love. For example, a wedding, right? We might hear a pastor talk about and define and use Paul's definition of what love actually is. But I'd actually like to suggest this morning that there's something a lot deeper going on in this text. And we often just read 1 Corinthians 13, but in order to discover that deeper thing, we have to go a chapter earlier to what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 12. In the chapter before, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is speaking of what we call spiritual gifts. And he's talking about the diversity of the church. He's talking about the diversity of humanity and how each of us has been given different spiritual gifts that we can use to serve the people around us. And so in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says this, To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. This is one of his spiritual gifts. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. Who knows what that means? To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So Paul is talking about spiritual gifts, and he gives us this really fascinating list of what these spiritual gifts can actually look like. But then, right at the end of chapter 12, Paul says something fascinating. In verse 31, he says, And yet... I will show you the most excellent way. It is the verse right after this one that starts 1 Corinthians 13. And I want you to see if you can notice any patterns. I'll put the spiritual gifts that were in 1 Corinthians 12 back up on the screen as I read 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men, or of angels, but I do not have love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying that love it's not just a feeling. It's not just a posture of the heart. It's not just something we experience. But Paul is claiming something incredible about love. He's saying that love is the greatest spiritual gift that humanity is capable of possessing. More than wisdom, more than tongues, more than prophecy, I will show you one that is even greater than these. Love is the greatest spiritual gift that humanity is capable of possessing. Now this is good news, my friends, and here's why. It is understood in Scripture that spiritual gifts can be developed and can grow. So whatever you imagine when you hear the word love, there is more. So maybe you can call back and remember the time that you got your first kiss. I mean, not the high school students, right? They, they, none of that. When you got your first kiss and, and you said to yourself, there is no greater love than this. There is more. 
When you got married, you looked at your partner, at your spouse in the eyes and realized that you were going to get to spend the rest of your life with this person. You said, what a great amount of love. There is more. When you had your first child, and you held that infant in your arms, and you said, how can there be more love than this? There is more. We serve a God that is love, that keeps on giving and giving, and right where we think we've gotten to the point where we've reached the maximum amount of realization of what love is, God says, no, 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 no. Love is the ultimate spiritual gift. It's the greatest spiritual gift that humanity is capable of possessing, and this spiritual gift can be grown into more. So this is good news, my friends. Now, this is also good news for another reason. Maybe some of you will resonate with this this morning. Some of you in this room do not have the spiritual gift of taking tests. Can I get an amen? amen? It's called boasting in your weakness. But you know what? That's okay. Because you, too, can have the greatest spiritual gift of love. Some of you in this room may not have the spiritual gift of being athletically inclined. Can I get an amen? But that is okay, because you can still have the greatest spiritual gift of love. Some of you may not have the spiritual gift of being super excited and extroverted all the time. Can I get an amen from my fellow introverts in the house? <laughs> but that is okay. Because you, too, can have the greatest spiritual gift of love. Wherever you are in your journey, however you think God has created you, whatever your strengths and weaknesses are, this is something, regardless of where we are in the body of Christ, that we can all share, that we all have in common. And it is not just something small that we all have in common. It is the thing that makes God who God is, and it is the ultimate spiritual gift that humanity is ever capable of possessing. And so, friends, I hope that you remember that faith is trusting that God can take evil and turn it into good. That you remember that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I hope that you remember that hope is acknowledging that even when the end result isn't what we wanted, there's still value in the work itself. That sometimes we may never see the fruits of our labor, but that does not take away from the value of the work. And most of all, I hope that you remember that love is the greatest spiritual gift that humanity is capable of possessing. Paul ends 1 Corinthians 13 in this whole case that he is making by saying, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Thanks so much for having me this weekend.